<clears throat> I'm sort of thinking about cheese now. What, you, you mm. like cheese? I love Emmental. You like Emmental? The one with the holes uh, in. Holy cheese I used to call mm. it as a kid. Great in a sandwich. Yeah. Emmental? What, what is Emmental? Emmental? Nutty. It's, it's, yeah, it's nutty. Nut, nutty. Nut, nutty flavor. Almost nutty, yeah. yeah. But the holes in. What do you mean nutty? There's no nutty cheese. Yeah. It's yeah. Called, sort of a nutty. That's what they'd say. <laughs> you know, there's those, some cheddars that have a crunch to them. Like when you've, there's almost like, and it like crunches in your mouth, but there isn't a crunch. But you, I'm going to put it out there. I'm not, that, I'm not a big cheese person. Mm. Really? So you a cheese person? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think when I went vegan, I was sort of dreaming about cheese. Everything else was quite easy to give up. Apparently it turns into something a bit like morphine in your system. You know, people say like, oh, chocolate's good for endorphins. Mm. Cheese is really kind of soporific. <laughs> so wait. <laughs> Such so, a so lie. So There's is... no way that cheese turns no. to like okay. equivalent of morphine. People who've never had morphine say it's yeah. very morphine-like. <laughs> <laughs> they've heard so cheese can be like morphine well that's why people find it addictive right. there's like a, obviously not actually like they're ruining their lives for cheese but so, so they, they not, test for cheese in the olympics you reckon see if they're dosed up on yeah they do it's really serious <laughs> <Is> it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah well you can't eat cheese before you get yeah. running apparently not sometimes yeah. they just they just sniff them like <laughs> Red Lester, get out they, of here. They, they, they just put a mouse in the room. <laughs> I just, yeah. I just don't, I don't understand the obsession with cheese. I don't understand why what people. Are you, I do mean, you, what do you like? Do you like wine? Do you like olives? Mm, what crackers? Like hummus. Oh, I like hummus. Yeah, yeah. No, Sh chauvinism. Hummus. Chauvinism. What, and what's wrong with hummus? Sports. No, I know. I, I, hummus is my my go to. Mm. Um, you do like hummus? I love hummus. I've seen your bulls covered in hummus actually. This is true. Quite a weird way to start off the podcast. Okay, so uh, it true. was an ex, ex, ex girlfriend. No, this sounds weirder than it was. We we were they were, they were, they were, <laughs> they were into some pretty kinky stuff. No, yeah. we were just drunk. What a that. waste of hummus! Yeah. No, 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 it didn't go to waste. <laughs> oh god, and she licked but, it off. No, no, she, she did not. Yes, Alex. she did. That's the bit I saw. No, you did not see any of I that. Had front no. row seats to that. No, you did not see any. So of is that. this where kink meets the very middle class? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, what are we going to rub on us? I'm going to get tamaslaser tonight. Mm. So you you put it on yourself? Yeah. No, I I I. I Thought it would be funny when I was younger to get a pot of hummus. Don't say younger. Well, yeah, yeah. It was young? when I was younger. How young? You were 27. You were 27. Okay, yeah. right, okay. So, Still an adult. Yeah. It's not an adult. I was young. You thought it would be funny. Yeah, yeah. I thought it would be funny. Was, was it funny? Uh, hilarious. <laughs> it was. <actually>. It was. <laughs> everyone was laughing. And this was like a dinner party situation. After the dinner party, yeah. Everyone's and, gone home. There's hummus left over. Yeah, there's hummus left over. And I said, what can I do with that? <laughs> Can't find the lid. Yeah. So my, did use my penis as a lid. And that would be funny. Right. And then what turns out is it's not that funny because then we talk about it years later on a podcast that it doesn't really work in the but same... But someone did eat the, the she, hummus. She licked the hummus off. No, because she, she hates lick... food waste. She did. <laughs> she, yeah. yeah. By the way, I found this out. What? Apparently when we clean out yogurt do you clean out yogurt pots do you clean out pots when you i'm very busy <laughs> that's a really really <laughs> unique question but i also don't put my genitals in them <laughs> so it kind of that's balances literally out. like what a mass murderer asks you a party before he kills everyone okay you so clean what out you mean for recycling pots? you clean out your yeah you pots. clean out your yogurt pots you, do you have you done that no <laughs> no no yeah well, well okay. apparently well, have you not do you not I, do that i, I probably, don't know do i probably have at some stage but what you you clean them out? Well, yeah, if I'm feeling that. Oh god, I should. So why is the up. reason to clean them out? Because otherwise they can't be recycled. Yeah, apparently. So. I don't really believe they're they're actually recycling our rubbish. Apparently, they're, they're recycling not. is a lot so worse. Why they're are not. You washing your yogurt pots. Yeah, because this is what I found out the other day. Yeah. So my whole theory was is that okay, fine, you're recycling. It's great. Mm. So apparently, it just doesn't ever get recycled. No, it doesn't. If it's like mixed recycling, they're just burying it somewhere. And so I feel sorry for the people at the sinks wiping their yogurt pots clean and their baked bean cans. Because <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> I guess no, you're, you're, very, you're foolish. Garden. You're idiots. <laughs> yeah. You're idiots. So you've been lied to. They're not idiots. They've yeah. been lied to. You hadn't been lied to. You just guessed. I was lazy. Yeah. You were lazy and then used it as a. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then was like, oh, what all came up Pasco in the end? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Saved all that time. <laughs> but apparently that's true. Apparently they send off the yeah. the rubbish to places like Poland where exactly. they just try and get it burnt off and it doesn't, yeah. doesn't do anything. Or they bury it in places or drop it at sea and it's all terrible. Yeah. And if, do you know, if the whole world, mm. every single person in the world was recycled, everyone recycled and all businesses were recyclable and everyone used like ethical sort of means and all these different things. We'd only clear up 7% of the world's plastic. 7%. Mm. We're absolutely buggered. We absolutely are. Yeah. 
So do you, do you try and do your things for the environment? Uh, I just, Here we go. I just had a baby and I think that's the worst thing you can do for the environment ever. <laughs> you just like <laughs> literally bring another consumer into the world. How really many, have you not offset your carbon emissions yet? I haven't. Actually. Can you do that with a baby? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you tell them they have to plant 5,000 trees <laughs> because of all the nappies you use. You know? Well, you tell the baby they have yeah. to. Well, right then just and there. So, you're not going to school, you're going to tree planting. Yeah, yeah. you're going to the woods. Well, yeah, you're going woods. to Brazil, to the Amazon, you're going to say sorry first. <laughs> no, and you can't fly there. I'm sorry. You have to walk there. Yeah, walk there or swim. And then you've got a lot of planting to do. And then maybe back in time for your GCSEs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got all of the guilt, but I don't, I don't. I don't think I do anything constructive, actually. Uh, yeah. And I hate all of those I statistics know. about oh, if you stopped doing this, like there's lots of stats about you know cows. Yeah, like, but I don't know any of these stats. Than, well, cows are worse than flying. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's it's like, like, so it's, it was like you're about to say something else and you couldn't quite see so what flying. Flying? Yeah. Do you know you get halfway through a fact and go, this is hearsay at most, and I don't know any of the numbers. No, the worst is when I don't think you ever have this, mm. but I had this a lot, is when you're at a dinner party and you're you're telling a story that mm. you think is quite funny. Mm. And as you're getting so halfway I got the through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then I took and my pants off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay that happens and as you're getting towards the end of the story you realize it's not going to be funny and other people oh, have drifted off I, and I, so then you almost lie and you make up a punchline well that is stand-up comedy <laughs> that is what that is it's like what you wish you'd said what you'd wish you'd done yeah. you just kind of fudge it i have the thing where i realize it isn't my story someone told it to me and sometimes they're there <laughs> Oh, so you're halfway through telling it and then you look at them and you go, oh shit, this a, is I'm yours. I'm a terrible liar. Oh <laughs> and God. I'll start the story and I'll have added some details, yeah. like some flourishes. You've, you've and then halfway it. through I can see from their face and they'll be like, oh, Katie told this to me. <laughs> <laughs> she met Robbie Williams. <laughs> you just have to like wink at them or something and be like, yeah. come on, just let no, me go. No, then I go, oh, that's exactly the same thing happened to me. That's strange. <laughs> <laughs> and then you also lie. Yeah. You keep lying through it. But do you, so yeah. that is, is that what stand-up comedy is, you think, where you, you, you're the type of, Comedians are the type of people who go, God, I, I wish I'd said that. that. I think it's the part of your brain that fictionalizes to make it more interesting. Mm -hmm. Really? And so it's a version of the truth that the really good comics, they say it very truthfully. So you I, feel like someone's telling exactly how they felt and exactly what happened. I always find it, I always find it tricky because as a comedian, you're always looking for content. Yeah. And that's tough. I, I've said this before. I said it to, I think, Phil Wang who came mm. on and he... I said, you're, everything's content all the mm. time, which, which becomes chaotic because then when do you switch off and switch on? Yeah. Because you, you can't switch off and switch on. You don't. And I also think it makes you quite a bad friend because other people are going through sort of, you know, a tragedy. And you're and looking at like, it as content. Oh, this is juicy stuff. So you're, you're, is, oh, what a nightmare. And you walked in on him, did you? Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. you're thinking, oh, this is great. And um, you do a thing, someone else will be talking. And again, it could be quite, and then you think, is there something in that? Yeah. Is there something in that? <laughs> I think it was, yeah. it was, it was Lou Sanders, someone who said to us that um, she, she had as well friends content and one of her friends, <laughs> one of her friends had a one night stand with someone and he didn't take off his jacket. Oh yeah, he, was, he just wore a parka the whole way through. It was something ridiculous. <laughs> oh no. Did he take off his clothes underneath I the parka? I think he just took his trousers off. <laughs> That's awful. That it's quite handy if you need to if you need to get out of there quick. Though. Yeah, you've got your jacket on, you can just run. run out the door. Also, depending on like if you're if you're on top of someone who's wearing a coat, at least it's like on the bed underneath. But if they're on top of you, like essentially you're wearing the coat as well. Yeah, it's for quite, a lot quite of hot, it. Yeah. quite stuffy. Yeah. Oh my god. Speaking of uh, sex, mm. you just had a baby. I just had a baby, but by IVF, not sex. You had about IVF, oh, yeah. wow. IVF baby, yeah. Oh my god, can we, can we? So talk, talk me through the whole thing. Um, well, first of all, you have to be very sad and infertile. <laughs> That's Sorry. pretty much the bottom line. <laughs> sad, sad and infertile. And, oh yeah, if you just if you're yeah. happily if you're infertile, happy, they won't, they you're like punching the air, going, "What a waste of condoms all this time." Um, so you have to be sad about it. I found the whole process amazing, and I know that's because I'm from this sort of positive place at the end of it where it mm, worked. Mm. The science of it is incredible. They're so yeah. good at it now. And so you take hormones, you get healthy. That's why I wasn't drinking. So you don't drink uh, for months and you mm -hmm. look at your diet and you take supplements and then you inject yourself. And I'm, I don't mind needles. So that bit was from your heroin days. From my, you gave me a bag of candy kittens when I got here. I don't want a bag of heroin when I leave. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever um, you like, we have it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but it is, but it's yeah. amazing. It continue. Yeah. 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 And so then 
Um, they take eggs and um, th- your partner goes and masturbates if you're going with a partner. And then the amazing thing is they make embryos and then they judge sort of who's doing well and who's not doing well. And then you get to watch it go inside you. So it's not, no, not amazing, Wait, what, what, which what, I didn't what? know. You get to watch you watch the... them put the embryo back inside you. Right. So... What, on, on, a, an on, a, on, a, on a screen, on a screen, oh on a screen like God. a shooting star, and that's so actually it's like asteroids, like the old computer game or something. Yeah, but with people, <laughs> <That's crazy. laughs> real people inside. <laughs> so, so it's not something that you're really separate from, mm. which is what I had expected it to be like. It's clinical, but it's not without lots of emotion and mm. magic. Actually, I thought that bit was magic. My husband was there as well, and then. Yeah, I found out we were pregnant, and then because you know it's a healthy embryo. Mm. Because I'm 40 mm. and I had, had uh, lost one. So there's all of these things that if you're trying to conceive naturally when you're mm. older, you have a lot more worry. And there was still lots of anxiety. And as I say, candy kittens were my... Yeah, um, that's, that's what that's what that I got addicted my, to. You got addicted my, during pregnancy? Just, just nailing candy kittens really? all the time. Yeah, that was my craving. Oh, wow. But, yeah. I, but I te- <laughs> that, Better than the heroin. <laughs> but, but I had a very big baby. <laughs> and they oh, kept saying, have you got gestational like diabetes? <laughs> and I was like, I've been eating a lot of sweeties. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm how not advising big, How big is the baby? Was it Now, he's, he's in the 99th percentile. He's really tall. <laughs> He's, like he's not like six foot, dude. Yeah, yeah, six foot. It's going to be great in Brazil when you're yeah, planting those trees. That's it's right. Huge. Yeah. Is, is he very big? Yeah. So, so how many pounds was he when he came oh, out? Oh, pounds. Actually, he was only nine pounds, but I had him early. Um, is that quite big, size. nine pounds? It's bigger. It's bigger. Yeah, I think about seven and a half. It's not massive. It's not like giant. It wasn't in the Guinness Book of Records, Six actually. pounds of it was candy kittens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's amazing. I had no clue about this, you know, especially with things like, um, firstly, when when you have to get pregnant, mm. I always think And this, you do have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Pope says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's what you do, right? You have to do it, yeah. right? <laughs> but uh, it's one of the only scenarios when you want to get pregnant is that you go from being told to never get pregnant because it's bad so use protection mm. use whatever you can don't whatever it is to suddenly going we well, now get pregnant yeah there's no in-between process and still in our current climate especially with uh you know the, the advancement of medicine and things like that we're still not told whether or not we're fertile yeah there's no process yeah, my husband has got a big problem with that like his sex education at school he said they never because they were so desperate for us not to get anyone pregnant mm. there was never any conversation about any other scenario so they don't talk about homosexuality. They don't talk about Mm-mm. all of the things you can do that don't get people pregnant. And they don't talk about that some people, it's not that simple. It's not going to be this thing that happens straight away because they mm. don't want you to know that. I but guess. why don't they want you to know that? Because I don't know. Or maybe they don't think it's their responsibility to talk about it. But it's, it's such a responsibility of teachers and adults and parents and things like that. Because do you know, the, you know, and you probably went through the same things. I remember speaking for you is that so my fiancés. Do you yeah. like the word fiancé? No, I hate it. Oh, do you? I don't like it. Because you did really cringe. I thought, do you hate her I, or I, the word? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hate it. It's mixed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a real mixed emotion, especially at the moment. Um, but yeah, fiancé is a weird term. But mm. her sister has frozen her ex mm. and... She went through this whole process of it and it was really intense and they yeah. managed to get a couple eggs and, it was, and it's okay. But she said, and I have other friends who are in their 30s trying to have a baby and they said, if only I was told earlier, if I had yeah. checked earlier, if all these things had happened earlier. Right. So then really we tricky. we went to the sperm bank and did it. I did, did you? It. Yeah, I did it. Wait, you frozen your sperm? No, I went An to the embryos. sperm bank. I went and wanked in a cup. So Speaking. you got embryos? Well, I didn't, I didn't, I got oh. rid of the cup. <laughs> you wanked out some embryos. So yeah, no. Did they want you to go in the clinic? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Is yeah. this hummus all over yeah, again? Yeah, yeah. Just went into a room and <laughs> he, did, he didn't have an appointment. <laughs> he just, just, just turned up just up a building. started wanking in the reception. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, get out. No, it's, it's the weirdest yeah. thing. Wait, what wait, did you do? So you've frozen your sperm? No, I didn't freeze anything. I just, oh, I went yeah. and checked it. Oh, uh, I see. Sorry. So have I not explained that? It's just talking about wanking in a cup. So sperm bank. So you went and had your sperm looked at. Yeah. I see. How is it? Have I not told you this? No. I'm sure I've spoken about this. Oh my God. So it's the weirdest scenario. You go to this, you go to this place, wherever it is. There's loads of them, I'm sure. So Harley Street, was it? I was not Harley Street. I was East London. Okay. I was, yeah, very edgy. Why have you gone to East London? Because I wanted my sperm to be edgy. (laughs) (laughs) Wherever you wank, that's what it comes. (laughs) Anyway, I, uh, you walk in there and there's a receptionist and the receptionist knows why you're there. So you're sort of, it's quite a weird story. You're, you're, so name and you're going jamie Lang, and things mm. like that and then and i'm thinking well you know why i'm here and it's to masturbate into a cup <laughs> <laughs> and they know that as well yeah. so it's a weird sort of but also i think they're also very over it like it's yeah. the first time you've well 
apart from the hummus, the time you've masturbated into a little plastic cup. But <laughs> no, I've done that a few times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a similar yeah. sentiment when you used to go clubbing, I think. Girls knew why you were there. It was to take them home and masturbate into a cup. <laughs> <laughs> Show them what you're capable of. <laughs> Yeah. yeah but so do you think the first day that they sit there as a receptionist they're going Ugh. i used to i when i was temping i years ago worked on a sexual health clinic just off tottenham court road mm. and so i used to have to make people's follow-up appointments when they'd got results oh, and God. i did find it and i never really got over it actually wait when an std clinic that's got yeah. a slightly different no thing. yeah because and because it's tottenham court road it was often people who were traveling and because of the nhs which is fantastic it means that people can have their sexual health checks here so they mm. wouldn't do it in a country would have cost them lots of money they would do it when they were here and get their medicine for free which is i think is brilliant yeah that's a great way yeah the less stuff that's floating around the better for all of us <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, get, were some patients who came in uh very different when they walked out some, some of them would have been because that would have happened all the time yeah absolutely Oh my Especially god. Especially if they'd come in a couple and then one of them finds out, like, <gasps> oh, that's why you brought me here. <laughs> oh oh god. Yeah. my god. Yeah. It's it's bad. So, so anyway, you, what you do is you go and then you uh, you get taken to a room and you get taken to this room and I, you sit in this room. What's the room? Do they give you materials? Yeah, they do. They give you like 80s porn. Yes. It's either that or you get a laminated iPad, which is what my <laughs> husband got. <laughs> <laughs> what? That so is the not, worst I, I, image I have ever. Isn't it grim? So rather than having the very old fashioned magazines, they're obviously like <laughs> getting with the times, but it's covered in plastic. So they're like wiped it that down. That is the people. most oh disgusting God. thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. They have a so, laminated so you iPad. Then, you can then access whatever <laughs> yeah. material you want through the iPad. Okay, got you. They have a laminated iPad. You, want, <laughs> you would expect these rooms to be a little more sexy. Like, like you would you want to walk in there, maybe music's playing. But then they'd never get rid of the blokes. I was going to say, yeah, they they people are going to hang around. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can go again. Yeah, <laughs> but there's something weirdly sexy about it. Like you're because uh, you've never, you know, when you're okay, you know, when you're going to have sex and you're yeah. like, oh, this is quite exciting. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yay! Yeah. Don't know why I was clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Very childlike. Yeah, you're going to have sex. It's quite exciting. It's like that moment you're like, oh, this is exciting. It's the same thing when you're going to one of these uh, sperm clinics because you get taken to the room and it's like uh, you're being led to this chamber. And then you, you open up the door and there's just a chair sitting in there and there's a TV on the wall and you can watch 80s porn. It's sort of the only place where you go, well, this is the only place I can really watch porn without feeling bad about it. Right. Mm. That's what, yeah, the, it's medical. It's medical. So you then do whatever you need to do. You then put your... And, and when you finish whatever you need to do, you never run out of somewhere so quick because it's so embarrassing. You put it in there and you almost feel like immediate regret. But you don't see anyone on the way out, do you? No, you don't see anyone. I thought they I was going to. They don't to. come back for you. They yeah. You so should, you're, you're you able to quite, scuttle away. You, you I didn't realise that. I, I was like pressing the lift. Like, hurry up. Like, <laughs> you should be quite good at that. You've had years of practice. of Scuttling away. Shoot, shooting your load and then running away. And then, <laughs> but, then, but then the results, that's what we need to know. Oh, so then the... the little uh, Jamie Lang. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go. Here we go. It? Yeah, little drum rolls. Um, so I got a call. They went, hello. And I went, hello. And uh, they went, this is Dr. Ever. And I went, hello, Dr. Ever. And they said, um, your results are back. And I said, well, what is it? And they said, I would like to give you an A star. Oh. But you've got good So, you, so good you're, meant to have, you're meant to have a minimum of, for men, it's a minimum of 40 million sperm. Mm. That's what you're meant to have. That's like mm. the sort of lowest mark that you sort of in terms of having a healthy amount. I had 320 million. Amazing. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa, you got fucking loads. I got loads yeah. of them. I got loads of them. Powerful. Well done. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that. But Sophie, she had hers checked, and I think hers were a bit more complicated. But I, I, that for women, typically, it seems a little bit more complicated. But it is, and also, I mean, they they can't tell you with with sperm they can look through a microscope and absolutely go they're swimming the wrong way they've got no heads give you a, <laughs> which it says a lot about a lot the dif them, different yeah. sexes we're a lot more straightforward yes whereas women which is why men are better <laughs> i don't know why people yeah, yeah. keep denying yeah, it yeah thank god we got round to it in the end yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is what we were trying to get yeah. to whereas with a, a woman what they can do is they can tell you things like um how many follicles you've got or the lining or this needs to happen but but it's a very inexact i think it's more of an mm. inexact science because all you need is to ovulate a healthy ovum at the right time in your cycle when you've had unprotected yeah. sex and you're going to have a, a healthy baby hopefully so it's, yeah. it's, but again one of those things for, for you it goes back to the same thing that sort of interesting content mm. right for yourself because even though it's a sort of anxiety driven experience and it's full of lots of ups mm. and downs and things like that it's sort of you again it's like content which yes. is a weird sort of juxtaposition yeah. 
It is. But what I would say is what's difficult about people finding out those things before they're with the person that they want to have a family with mm -hmm. is, would you want it hanging over you? Like, would you want someone to tell you at 22, oh, by the way, you're infertile or you're going to find this difficult? I've got um, like PCOS. So and true. lots of people And lots of people then think as a teenager, I'm not going to be able to have a family. Or they meet someone on a date mm. and they're talking about that stuff too early because they're not able to just find out what happens over years. They have yeah. to say, oh, by the way, I'm 34. I don't have many eggs. So I never thought of that. Do you not? Th that, that is totally, the pressure I, I, absolutely. And also in terms of life decisions, you want everyone to flourish and concentrate on their jobs and try different jobs if they hate that job. You don't want them thinking, I don't have any time. Mm. Wow. So then you're stuck in a, in, a, in a place where you don't really know what to do. And because it might make you unhappy when you don't need to be, because it might all be fine. Uh, it's, yeah. like one yeah. of the, it's like one of those things which is, um, would you rather be told when you die or how you die? Mm. That is the kind of same scenario. It's like, what do you yeah. pick? <gasps> well, yeah, oh. What do you pick? Yeah, I don't know. I always love that thing about how every year you live through the date of your death, but you don't know. Oh my God. Every year. Yeah. Could be today. But it's so true. Yeah. I, I also, which I didn't realize, and uh, you said this before, but I didn't realize the amount of women that have miscarriages. Yeah. It's something like one in yeah. three. Yeah, it's a lot. And I, um, it, it's such a, when, when it happened to me, it was just so horrendously awful because we've been trying to get pregnant for ages. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually didn't find the commonality of it any um, consolation. Because someone, people going, oh, you know, it's so common. And I was like, other people, I don't care about <laughs> anyone else's. Yeah, yeah. I really, really care about mine. Yeah. But what I think is fantastic, even you bringing it up, the fact is that you do know it. Like mm. there isn't a new word in your mouth. You know when it's happened to friends or... Mm. So I do think hopefully what there is is just no secrecy about it. And also that thing about people not being able to talk to people about their pregnancy early on in case it happens, which is such a backwards thing. But I, th but I think... It's it's, so people don't talk about it in Until case 12 it, weeks. Yeah, you're not like, meant to. Yeah, with well, so we're not meant to. People really do think it's like a rule. And after 12 weeks, you get a scan and then you start letting people in, right, okay. which means that if you do have a miscarriage you're essentially going to work traveling everywhere with all of this pain and very few people to talk to and same for with heterosexual people same for men like i think they go through so much yeah i, I think so well. i think it's i think it's probably I, I haven't obviously touched wood on i, I, I you know th that hasn't happened but i think it, it's i think for i'm guessing for a woman though because that's something inside of you right and also from from experience from other people from telling me and like Elizabeth Day, who oh, is, yeah. she talks about it, how she had yeah. it in um, the bathroom. Yeah. She had it in the bathroom and she was embarrassed. Yeah. She had a miscarriage. In the well, she, she it was in Fleabag, actually. Yeah, yeah. So, when, um, so Elizabeth Day's podcast, How to Fail, when mm. she interviews Phoebe Waller-Bridge, there's this really exceptional conversation about how Phoebe had borrowed Elizabeth's miscarriage. Mm. And essentially, Elizabeth had been interviewing, she's a journalist, interviewing someone. And when she'd gone to the bathroom, she started bleeding. Right. And then she'd gone back and carried on with the interview because she was too embarrassed. I don't yes. know if that was the word she used, but essentially she didn't know how to, so she was just professional, carried on. And that really struck Phoebe. And then she kind of borrowed it and put it into the second series of Fleabag with the sister character. Yeah. yeah. Which is, which is uh, in insane that actually what happens is with, I mean, a huge amount of women and men probably, but women, because they have to experience it, there's a sense of almost shame or embarrassment or like, oh God, this has happened. I don't really want to tell anyone, don't want to make mm. a fuss. And you continue, it's, yeah. that's but wild. I think, but I think it's also, I, I would say it's a, quite a shock. So actually there are situations where you don't deal with it at the time. Mm. Like you, you kind of cope for a bit. And then afterwards you go, isn't that odd that I went into well, that numb place and it's, it's carried on? It's like mourning, you're mourning a loss almost. And a lot of people, when they go through mourning, they don't deal with it. Absolutely, there, especially they, not. They delay it, so I imagine yeah. that's probably what happens. Yeah, and they keep going, actually, I feel fine. Yeah, yeah. I feel fine that daddy's dead. <laughs> and then six <laughs> months later, yeah, they're good, like, okay. <laughs> turns out I'm not fine. Yeah, yeah. 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 That is literally a friend like that at the moment who is grieving, but hasn't started the grieving, but like, I'm just doing loads of admin. It's just lots of admin. That's all that death <laughs> is, like, isn't it? Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, is, yeah. that is what happens. You go to this sort of manic stage, I think. But, I, but I also what, you know, and not to really pry, but I suppose that's one of the private parts is... I think this is a perfect sex yeah, education yeah. podcast. I think that's what, less cheese, yeah. <laughs> more sex yeah. education. This is what we need, right? Yeah. But, it, but it's very easy, right? When you, when you say something like that to what could normally happen, especially um, from uh, men is that you go, okay, we don't really know what to say here. So let's not talk mm. about it. But actually the important thing is to talk about it because um, I think actually a lot of the time people get embarrassed that they've asked the wrong question or said something. Oh, yeah. But actually it's, it's interesting to know these things yeah. because it should be wider known that this happens a huge amount and how upsetting it is. I think about all human experiences, Jamie, 
we sometimes feel like, oh, I'm not qualified to ask because I don't know. And I think a well-meaning, well-intentioned question, and then someone can either say, I don't want to talk about it. Or, <laughs> oh, um, you, you, don't, you don't understand this. Mm. I, th- I, I feel like that's the thing is that quite often when we're worried, we shut things down. It's very British and let's not talk about anything emotional. Like it's, mm. it's so clear when someone's asking a question because they genuinely care and are interested that you couldn't be offended or upset. Mm. Yeah, but, th- but then also we're living in this time, which we're going to get to, is a time of like cancellation and things like that. So then you start to go, oh God, what can I say or what can't I oh, say? Oh, do you worry about that? No, I don't care. <laughs> do you Heroin. Ever, do you ever, when you record your podcast, do you ever afterwards think like, oh, I made that joke? <laughs> you do sometimes. Do you? Well. I don't ever. That's not true. When you, do I? Do well, when the last time I get? Bit. Nah, I'm not really. Because yeah, I, I think that actually people think that I'm harmless. Like, so people know that I'm not out there being, making sort of, really heavy political view political views about stuff and mm. or saying things which i truly believe i'm more questioning things what's right yeah. so what's the saying wolf in uh, sheep's clothing or something? <laughs> yeah <laughs> you think that's who i am yeah. right yeah. but i but I, I i think more the question is when you when you had the miscarriage how did that emotionally make you feel i mean i was absolutely destroyed i'm, really? I'm bringing it up now it was um sort of just over a year ago yeah. and then we got pregnant a couple of months later, but um, I was absolutely destroyed. And even um, I look at photographs of me at the time or like because of work, sometimes I've been filmed and I can just see how sad I am in my eyes. Yeah. And I honestly thought I was never gonna be okay again. Oh. And so even in answering that question, I do feel okay again. Yeah. But also I'm really wary of the narrative of, uh, because I had a baby. And it's not that, because I know that there's this thing of like, oh, we lost one, but then we got one, or mm. we did IVF because we were lucky enough to have resources and to yeah. do that. But yeah, I really thought I was never going to be okay. Oh my God. Yeah. And that's the thing is, it, that thing, that's the thing about the commonality. Like for me, it was like, oh, that was the end of my universe. Because, because it had taken us so long, what I didn't realize, and what's so unfair, is... Um, when you have like this miracle, like when so we were about to start IVF when I got pregnant naturally. Mm. So we were waiting, you have to start, you start it when you start your period. So you're waiting for a period, didn't happen. Waiting for a period, didn't happen. It was like 35 days. And our nurse said, oh, well, have you done a pregnancy test? And so I did one. And then it was like that whole day, we couldn't even say the words to each other because this magic thing had happened and we'd got pregnant oh naturally. So the, so the start of it was so, oh my God, the miracle. And I, because it was a miracle, I was like, this person just wanted to exist. Yeah. And look how long we waited for them. So, and so then when I started bleeding, it was like, no, 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 no. Like, this is not the narrative. You don't have a miracle uh, to feel, have it yeah. taken away. And then um, I was really worried at the hospital that they would be really callous. Mm. That I thought, because these nurses see it all the time, and just because it's the end of my universe. And actually they were so kind. They were so kind because they... They said, if you've been trying for, they basically said, if you're an old woman who's been trying for years and years, it's, it's heartbreaking. So they, they allowed me to be heartbroken. <laughs> you call yourself an old woman. <laughs> no, in, in terms of fertility, that's what I definitely felt like. And I felt like I deserved it. And that actually I had, had all of that guilt. Because, but why? Because if I'd had kids at 30, maybe I wouldn't have had a miscarriage, but I didn't, I wasn't in love at 30. Yeah, and so also I didn't, want, I didn't want children mm. in my early 30s. I'm one of those people who went from, I definitely, definitely don't want kids. Yeah. Maybe I do want kids, I don't know. When I was 35, I was suddenly like, oh my God, life is so long. Like, what do you do if you're not making yeah. packed lunches? Yeah. <laughs> Look, it is, it is, life is- I, I, Everyone's I, like, it's so short, it's so short. And then you get to like 36 <laughs> or 37, like, oh my God, I'm so bored, I've done everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's fucking long. Yeah, really long, it's no one really tells long. you. And then I suddenly started thinking about like generativity and being part of a community and mm-hmm. wanting to, of the different values I had to my life. So then I was in this place and then I met my husband who's much younger than me and definitely wanted children. How much younger? I think six or seven years, seven years there younger. We yeah, here we go. Here we <laughs> go. Here we go. Yeah. Here, we, here go. we go. So I met my young husband and- um, Does he wear a jacket? When- <laughs> Keeps it on. Keeps he always, all, he actually keeps all his clothes on. Only takes off his socks. I think that this might. This is where you were going wrong. This is why you struggled for so why many years. Why did you let the clinic ask your husband pregnant. keep all his clothes on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if only you yeah, knew. That's, that's why Damn his sperm count was so low. Is because he was trying to get them through denim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which it was actually impressive that he managed to get any, any of at all. Yeah. Majority like, just, is quite a hard fabric. Yeah. So we, we did just sperm test, and they're all wearing parkas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You should really think about changing your jeans because yeah. they're very strange, crusty white. <laughs> <laughs> I like 
yeah, that was the line. Yeah, yeah. The, the joke Too stopped gone. being yeah, fun. Yeah. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, now yeah. you're cancelled. Yeah, yeah. Now I see I'm why right. you're worried. I knew it'd be the genes. Oh. Yeah. But so it's true. So you then feel this guilt because you're you're thinking, well, if only this had happened earlier, then I wouldn't be in this situation. Yes. And you'll and you'll feel um, a sense of. Uh, I don't know what it would be, but towards your partner, you feel like, I'm sorry that this is now, you feel a sense it's of... It's definitely a joint experience. Yeah. And I think... You blame yourself, so, right? Yeah, Rather so in than... heterosexual couples, I think what probably happens is the man feels, oh, I'm not allowed any emotions because it's, it's her, her yeah. body. And then she feels, I couldn't give you something you were so desperate for. So, oh. I, so I think, it, and, but, but I think hopefully... Or like with all sad things, you want it. You want to communicate and it to bring you closer together rather than all. Oh, we I don't I, talk I, about it. I definitely it. feel like with men there is this weird like paternal thing that happens, and then suddenly when the baby's gone, it like it really fucks with their heads as well. But you're so right about like them not allowed to necessarily feel that because it's not in them. Type yeah, thing. or they have to put it away to wait. Um, me and my husband both have you lock it up. Ther- have lock therapy. it up. Yeah, and um, something my therapist brought up after months and months after the miscarriage um was she 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 said that she felt my husband was waiting until there was space and then he would be able to do his grieving because he had had to be so got to be strong empathetic yeah. and strong and and considerate to me so it's almost like we both did my phase and mm. then it was like waiting for his, his time Just to watching go. Watching the clock. Yeah. <laughs> Hurry up. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, are you okay today? Yeah. 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 She seems pretty Hurry choppy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. I'm going to start drinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, but it's, it's true. And I think that, um, I think it's very brave to talk about those things mm. as well because it's such a personal experience. Yeah. But I, this is where to come back to the original, original thing about the comic, the, the comedians, people like me and Phil Wang and Lucy Sanders who do talk about our lives. Mm. There's also a wiring that makes you want to share everything. And not everything is suitable for jokes, but you do still have a little thing about, okay, attention. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you about my worst day. Yeah, but that's yeah. true. But, th- but that also must be very therapeutic because you can get yeah. to go on stage and you talk about things that make you feel better, that you get off your chest. And yeah. also you make it in a funny way. And as we know, humor is the greatest medicine mm. out there. So actually then you turn to what is a terrible situation and not into a better situation. I've never tried morphine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that stuff is good. But it's true. Yeah. You know, it's either that or what you go and start drinking. And that's what a lot of people do, right? You, you yeah. have to like get it out of you somehow. It's, it's, it's beautifully communal. So comedy in general, whether you're talking about, oh, using a little machine at Tesco or um, something deeply personal, what you mm. feel in laughter is like absolute recognition. Like, ah, oh, we understand the emotions you're talking well, you, about. We have the same human experiences. You've just connected with a human, right? And yeah. You're getting an actual physical yeah. response back. And so, so it's and, quite... it, and it's great. And uh, connection is exactly what it is when it works. The yeah. laughter is like, we're with you. Yeah. And it's brilliant. And, but and I think the lack of and is, the lack of laughter is, is painful. Try again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. Uh, but then when you're on stage and you start talking about let's say a miscarriage or something mm. like that, which is typically not a funny mm. subject. Yeah. And the audience then are thinking, well, I'm here to laugh. Yeah. And so you because and also we know in comedy, right? The the punchline is the thing that you're not expecting almost, right? Yeah, that's the be. that's the point of sort of comedy in, mm. in a sense. But when you're making a joke about your own self and it's to do with miscarriage or whatever mm. it is or divorce or whatever, you know, breaking up, whatever it is. There's a sense of like, God, are we laughing? Is this the right place to yeah. laugh? So you have to force that laugh over the edge. Well, I actually think the key is that you can only talk about those very sad things once you're okay. Because what you know is when someone's not okay and it's not funny. So laughter in general is, it's fine. We're all fine now. Mm. This is We laugh because we know you're okay. So when, when you're actually still in it and it's still raw, mm. it's, there's, not, there's not that much laughing. I, and I've seen comics come out when something big's going on, can be divorce or bereavement or something, yeah. and they come out and talk about it when they're not, and the audience literally just go, "I just want, I need you to be okay." Oh, when, so they curl up, yes. they sense it. No, and, oh, yeah, yeah, and it's okay. the same with them. Um, actually, it's the same with heckling and stuff. You heckle and actually looks like they can take it. You don't heckle someone who's having the worst gig of their life usually. Really? Yeah, they 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 they, they heckle people who seem like they can handle it because it's too uncomfortable to watch someone. Having a I've never. Time. That's such a that's such a sort of psychological way of the, the audience knowing that. As it, they, they might be very quiet when you're very new at comedy. No one heckles you, and you think it's because you're amazing. Mm. And then you realise it's because you were shit. You would have fallen over. <laughs> like yeah, you were so bad. No one thought this is going to be fun. Red <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they, they didn't need to heckle you. <laughs> no, they didn't need to. It's, it's, like, killing it yourself, in, it's yeah. like killing in cold blood. It's like yeah. literally just going. Well, now I'm going to heckle him. It's not even yes, funny because yeah. it's just. <laughs> and it's just like oh god, that person so needs us to this to go well, and it clearly isn't <laughs> so, going well. 
sounds like hunting a baby deer. It's like, yeah. you just can't do it. Yeah. 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 And you wait until someone's like, hey, how you all doing? And it's like, I'm going to take that person down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why is it that though? Why when you have confidence on stage, do people go, right, I'm going to try and take that person Most down? Most people don't. I just guess then it seems like, well, this is fair play. You've come out here and said you're going to entertain me. I'm not entertained. So, let me let me tell you. Oh, it, it, you might as a, as a comic, you must just really understand the psyche of individuals. You you because you know what makes people laugh, right? Mm -hmm. And you know what people makes people not laugh. So therefore, you understand what people are like because you understand what triggers they have. And and that's yeah. weird. So then, when you you can read body language and understand someone so well, you definitely right? get obsessed with it. Yeah. But what you're what's obsessing is that it's always different. So like an audience is not the same. Doesn't have the same qualities. Stuart Lee's had an amazing routine of several years ago about inconsistency and about how your best bit when it doesn't work because the audience is different. Right. So it's your best joke. It's your best writing. You've performed it to the best of your ability, mm. but they just, for, for, for other reasons to do with them or the room or things that have happened, or maybe you stumbled and didn't realize it's that that's obsessing. That you're, you could be quite so good at your job and then terrible at your job the next night. Why does that happen? It, it, I, 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 I've yeah. said this on the podcast before. I did stand up and. Did uh, you? Yeah, I did. Oh, it. I didn't know that. Yeah, don't worry. You, well, you didn't hear. You didn't hear, right? Oh, how, yeah. How, so, that's so mad. Where, yeah, did, where, that, did, where did you do stand up? So, when you were already <sighs> successful or before? Uh, no, uh, when I was doing Chelsea and things like that. I so, see, so okay. and I did it at the comedy store. Oh, did you? Yeah. I don't think they were. Were they liked nice that. to you? Uh, no. The audience were very nice. Okay. In the first one. Yeah. And I thought I was king of comedy. I, it's I an walked, amazing feeling. Oh, my. I walked up and went. Yeah. Should have been doing this for years. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing it's, feeling. But then the second time, I said this before, when you lose the room. Yeah. I lost the room. And, oh, oh, awful. And, and I, I didn't realize losing the room was a thing. Yeah. Like it, it actually is a, you see people, you know, when you're so embarrassed, you're, your feet go, mm -mm. you do that and, and your shoes go, you can see yeah. people doing that. And you're yeah. like, oh my God, this yeah. is terrible. Yeah. But, and also it happens a lot. And the, the only difference is you don't have any of the tools because it's happened to you hundreds of times yeah. to try and go, well, this is. I mean, because you have to acknowledge that situation and you have to show fearlessness. Mm. You would have been scared. So that, so you lose them. And rather than going, I've lost hundreds of rooms and then had standing ovations after winning them back. I'm not scared of this. Instead, you go, I've lost them. <laughs> They've gone forever. <laughs> And I have to carry on. <laughs> yeah. I, I tend to yeah. take like a fake phone call. Mate, you think on stage, oh, you, you think, how can I get out of this? And you hear your own voice and you're, you're talking, yeah. but also in your head. Yeah, so the yeah, two yeah, things happen, imagine. you go, I'm actually insane. <laughs> how is this still going? <laughs> There's a louder voice in my head saying, run. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it actually is true. Oh, it's, it's awful. It's, it's like you, do, you hear your voice and then you hear an echo, but it's not the echo that's in your head. Your head is going, this is fucking shit. This is yeah. shit. Get out of here. Yeah. Uh, fake, I, fake and, then, a, and then you meet eyes with someone who goes, doesn't want to meet eyes. You're like, don't look at me, and you're like, why? I thought that was a nice lady. <laughs> it's, it's literal yeah, hell. It you, sounds you, like hell. You're yeah. on stage in the center of the dent. You're center of the dent, and you're also the play. Yeah, and no one and wants to look. Sometimes you. you're because you're waiting for someone to go. This is so fucking shit. You're trying to work out what you would say in response to them going. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. Like, I think that's actually what hell would be having yeah. to relive that every night. Yeah. Well, I told you the moment that I I had to. I told a joke and someone didn't hear it. So they told me to redo the punchline, <laughs> and they weren't even heckling. They just wanted to hear it. Oh really? Well, that's they went, quite "Can you nice. do it again?" And I went. Oh. Well, so this wasn't like the film. This is just genuinely an audience member. An audience. Have another run of that. <laughs> yeah, it might yeah. hit the second time. Come yeah, on. it definitely didn't. The, oh. the thing is, in your absolute defense here, because yeah. people say, "Oh, stand up's really scary," and they think of something like that. You doing a proper long set at the comedy store, which is mm. the, like the biggest and most important club on the circuit. Mm -hmm. So, but really, how stand up starts is very, very privately. You do mm. very small gigs with a little pad. Or, and you do very short amounts of time. So by the time you get to that gig, you've got hundreds of gigs of practice. You don't get thrown in there like that. Even with the five minute tryout at the comedy store at the weekend, someone will have done 150 gigs before they get there. Get to do that. So they will have experience with certain things. It's so true though. Whereas what you, you said, yeah. I mean, it's so unfair that setup. No, it's so true what you said though, is when that happens, they've gone. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've all gone. And with you, you're going, well, they've gone, but I can get them back somehow. Yeah. So you, you, you're trained into doing it. So just quickly before we end part one, I do want to know, you said that you never, and just because of mm. the private watch, you said that you never, thought that you could be yourself again you could find it again oh yeah and i think that's really profound because mm. um i think a lot of people who uh go through similar experiences or other experiences and i think everyone everyone speaking today have been through certain scenarios right but you do find yourself and when when you're in that scenario your brain is working so backwards against you mm. that you really feel you can never get out of it yeah and 
that's a really scary place to be in because yeah. you just think that you can never find happiness. Yeah. I actually started stand up when I uh, from a breakup and you know you have you have breakups and then you have big breakups. Yeah. Um I'm sure you've both had one where you know <laughs> I uh, was sort of you know, crying on the kitchen floor, kind of. Yeah. It's when you're eat, heaving. Classic. Yeah, yeah classic. don't, don't want to eat ever again. Don't mm. want, like, and you do just think that's that was it, and yeah. and it's, it's a pain, like a real physical pain. Yeah, no, and you're so miserable. <laughs> you're so miserable. People go, you look well. You're like, yeah, you're like what? <laughs> Oh God. Dead. I don't have any organs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, um, and um, and and it's so it's such a raw thing. So it's not about like that bit. Mm. I don't think there's any, you can't find a positive and you shouldn't. And I think that pain is just like happiness. It's another emotion and you, you do have to live through it. I think what can happen, I'm, I'm using that example because it's such a healable pain, yeah. which I wouldn't want to say about anything else, but there then comes this like quite juicy bit after a breakup where it's slightly less raw, where you get lots of energy. You might write a poem. Oh. <laughs> you might, you might. Oh, yeah. Calm down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you, sort of, you, you sort of think, oh, I'm going to join an evening class or <laughs> might write I'm going to go a to a gallery. Like you, <laughs> Sorry. That's not, that's not historically I might how write you, so you have a bit of energy, so you go, I can write a poem, think go to like, evening class. When you've had a rejection and you're, you're single yeah. and heartbroken, so you're not like looking for anyone else, that can be quite a creative time. That's it's what an I mean. empowering moment. Yeah. So you're like, oh, Okay, I'm in a movie right yeah, now. Yes, so and you, or you might book tickets for things. You just you you start thinking yeah. about life again. You're exploring in things other than chasing someone else. Yeah, and there's a space left in your life. And you would just say, "Good comedians do yeah. is they acknowledge it and they make it really funny." I used to say it on stage for that situ very situation. If I lost the audience, I'd go, "I know you're not having a good time now, and you know you're not having a good time now. We all know." <laughs> and I said, "But it's um, I said uh, yes, it's, comedy's like sex." that um, if neither of us are enjoying it, we should just stop. <laughs> just uh, maybe finish ourselves off at home, watch a Lee Evans DVD. <laughs> but, but you don't, but you carry on because what? it's more embarrassing to go, you're, you're not into this. And especially with sex, like it's so just awful that you just go, well, maybe they don't know I, <laughs> how badly this is going. I had that in sex once with someone. We, we, what, you? Yeah, yeah. This we, must have been pre-30. Yeah, I know, I was, yeah, yeah pre-30. Jay was, has this, uh, this saying where you've got a man. Yeah, men don't get good at sex until they're 27. 100%. Oh, yeah. Men don't. Post, they don't. Yeah. Post 30, you said. No, uh, yeah. uh, pre 27, so men aren't good at sex. Good, so, what makes men good at sex then? When they're not selfish. Okay. And you think that stops? I think it stops to 26, 27. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I think, I think it's very dangerous to extrapolate to an entire gender. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm generalizing. So you, so, you in your late 20s started to realize, oh, there's someone else here sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's someone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I had sex with someone, and I must have been about 19, 20. And it wasn't in 1920, but it sounded like it. <laughs> yeah, in 1920, yeah. we were having sex and uh, it was at the end of a sort of party and we were had sort of having, we started like hooking up and then having sex on the sofa and the, the lights were so bright oh, in, in the room. Where were you? Were you in the, yeah, it the was clinic? In, no, it's yeah. in, the, in the sitting room and we just, it was so awkward, the whole thing. And, and we just <laughs> both continued like, and, yeah. and it was the most okay. horrendous thing that's in the world. That's what bad stand-ups like. You're doing your best moves <laughs> that you've practiced before and they've mm. always worked. And you're just getting this awkward response to it. And you're like, I only know other moves like this. <laughs> <laughs> just, there's no way this is going to get any yeah, better. Yeah. If you're not like it. Because I did say, yeah. I said in my first stand-up, one of the jokes was, and I didn't say this in my second mm. one, but I said, uh, doing stand-up for the first time is like having sex uh, for the first time. I know I'm going to enjoy it. You're not. But I yeah, know that yeah. I am, and that one, they quite and they were That's so. A very funny observation. Yeah, that was a yeah, yeah. funny observation because I know that it's going to be okay for me. You're probably mm. not going to enjoy this, and that made them but feel more comfortable. It shows confidence. Is what I mean. So the acknowledgement of you're going to have a terrible time makes them think, oh, I'm actually quite enjoying that. You see, oh that, that, wow! So it brings you're down saying, the expectation. You're basically, you're very, you're, you're going. I'm terrible at this. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm not scared. And they go, great. It's all great fun. Because you're allowing them because to come in. Because you're not going on going, hi, my name's Jamie Lang. If this doesn't go well, I'm going to hurt myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> laugh. Nothing rides on this. Like, this isn't my job. <laughs> like, I don't need this, like, gig money. <laughs> like, and then they go, oh, fantastic. It doesn't matter. It's so true. But, okay, just before we said then part one, but, um, so, but you're happy and okay now. Yes, thank you for Sorry, checking yeah, good, good, yeah. at the end of the half. <laughs> yeah. Let's get all the good bits. <laughs> all right, everyone, we'll stop there for part one. We'll see you in part two, everybody. Bye-bye.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to part two of Private Parts. So I want to ask you a big question oh, yeah. uh, about Oscars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, never been nominated. Never been, to no- my knowledge. <laughs> never been nominated. <laughs> yeah. Will Smith, Chris Rock. Oh, yeah. As Wait, a comedian. What happened? Is that okay, as a, okay, firstly, two things here. There's two big questions. Okay. Firstly, as a comedian, I want to hear your thoughts. Right. Secondly, as a, as a woman. Okie dokie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but also w- being a woman, uh, putting yourself in Jada Smith's position. Right. It, wrong, right, everything oh, above. See. What do you think? Well, I think it was a very clear... Thank you for asking me this. Is that... Is that and is... Because actually what I think is that it was... The, the furore afterwards made it clear how mixed messages men are getting about how to be a good man. Wait, right. what do you mean? What do you mean? Because I... Look, I didn't grow up male. But I saw a lot in Essex at school and afterwards this idea of manhood, being mm. a man. Yeah. Loyalty, defending, sticking up for yourself, what's right. Like there, was, there was lots. And one of them did involve sort of violence is necessary in some situations. Mm. When I grew up in Montford, there was absolutely a sense that you defended your mum, for instance. Your mum jokes yeah. were mm. the worst thing at school because someone was insulting someone who wasn't there, who was your mother. And that and was a you situation. Would fight them. Or, or there would be a situation where that would absolutely be legitimate. And in terms of, so fast forwarding that 30 or 40 years and then mm-hmm. seeing Will Smith defending his wife, he wasn't defending himself and he would no. never have done that if it was a joke at his expense. That little, that little knife edge he was sitting on when another man, several feet away, I think it's really tricky because obviously we're not at school anymore and no one thinks that, fighting is right but i think we i think men get complicated messages yeah they do Be like this this is strong but not too much like that but is there is there i mean what do you think oh, no i just i think as a society in general we're just so confused no one knows what the hell to do anymore because two things are true at once yeah like, because you have this evolutionary truth which is here's how you be a strong man yeah that's respected and that makes you much safer and less yeah. likely to be sort of attacked by other men but then you have this like modern society put over the top which says, do that and you'll go to prison. As a comedian, is, is there sometimes when you get to a point where a joke is not funny? Obviously, oh, yes. All the time, jokes aren't funny. And this is where comedy, and when I say dangerous, I don't mean, obviously, people in the world actually have danger in their mm-hmm. lives. Um, but there is a danger because everyone has to get the joke for it not to be offensive. And that's, that's never going to happen. No, but it does happen. And that's why you end up with things like with Jimmy Carr's recent yeah. like, show. That show was on Netflix for weeks it was number one trending before someone pointed out excuse me that joke is absolutely abhorrent mm. and then everyone read it or saw it out of out of <laughs> context of the show and went how could you just put those words together and say it out loud but he was touring that show and all audiences weren't revolting or walking out or because mm. they were seeing it i mean it's such a strange thing because you'll see you're seeing it in in context rather than because seeing if you it- took lots and lots of jokes out of the person's mouth and wrote i mean saw it written down you'd go Bullying, bullying, nasty, making the world worse. <laughs> bullying, yeah. bullying, 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 bullying. I know, and, I, and, I, and I say this as a comic who on panel shows, I laugh at things I think I don't agree with. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and mm. I'll go home and go, God, I'm the worst. I'm the person sitting next to the bully. Being like, oh, 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 saying that about Theresa May's hair. Oh, 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 oh. Like that. And you go, I'm, I'm, I'm even worse because I don't think you should be mean. But that's a personal choice. I don't think you should be mean. But then sometimes what you think isn't mean. Someone's points out um, so that like, actually is mean and it's then like you, a yeah. like a societal bandwagon they then implant the anger into people that didn't originally have anger yeah. from the jokes they're like oh actually maybe i should be annoyed or, or you this. just think about it differently because you go <laughs> we we laugh because we have this sort of empathy failure or empathy gap we're like mm-hmm. oh it's wordplay i know he doesn't mean it and then someone points out well actually these people are having a terrible time in in their lives because of jokes like this they're getting bullied in the playground or this is happening or um, they're not being uh, properly respected by the government. And then you go, oh God, it's so awful. And why would he say that then? Why would, why would a rich millionaire like punch down to these people? And as soon mm. as you consider that, of course you don't think it's funny at all. And no joke, I think, can survive that kind of dissemination. Mm. But, then, but then you could do not that. Like, no, but I'm still chuckling. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah still funny no, or funny. Yeah, yeah, you're like, no, the minute you're bringing actual people's pain up, oh, yeah, I yeah. get that. Okay, but then if we go back to this scenario, so so we so we established that sometimes a joke can be unfunny, but all the time, all the time it can be unfunny. Mm. But in in the in the if you tell the joke 
Okay, it, 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 let's take Jimmy Carr for example, yeah. right? Okay, if, if he says the joke in front of the front of people, you know, that in front of you know a group of people, then surely you're sort of doing it in open sides again. Then you're sort of it is a joke because you're it's sort of that tongue in cheek way. Mm -hmm. So Chris Rock at the Oscars doing it in front of Jada Smith, it, it's obviously a joke because mm -hmm. it would be nasty if you did it behind someone's back. Does that make sense? It definitely makes sense. And I think it's a, a, an argument that you could use. I remember when I very first started comedy, I can't remember, it was an American comic talking about how if you had to change your material based on the tables at the front. So mm. for instance, if you had a joke and then you had a big table of African-American people and you thought, okay, I'm going to skip that joke, then that's a racist joke. Yeah. Mm. So there definitely is some value in that kind of thinking. But when Chris Rock or whoever wrote his stuff for the oscars thought about that joke he didn't think he was going to upset jada pinkett smith i don't think he was like i don't care if i upset her my joke is so brilliant about gi jane mm. yeah whereas sometimes comics do know that they upset people like ricky gervais with trans people mm. knew that he was going to upset people and was upsetting people and believed that his routine was so important or strong it didn't matter that's weird though. I, I find it weird. I find it weird when so I, I saw this with another comic, an American comic, who um, they were doing some sort of roast or something like mm -hmm. that. I can't remember what it was. And a lot of his material was taken out because it was too offensive. Oh, really? And he said, well, I want my whole thing to be pulled. Oh. Because it, for, for me, my, my, my stand-up isn't as good then without that. So if oh, that see. isn't in, which I find strange, right? Which is, seems like a, that seems yeah. like a sort of a, 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 a elitist sort of like view on yourself. I don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I think it'd be like if someone came into your podcast and went, okay, so we liked it when you're talking about miscarriage, but we're going to take everything else out. And you'd be like, but then it's a weird chat where we just say to Sarah Pascoe, so you've had a miscarriage. <laughs> and you might go, that's not our conversation really meandered. I'm good at interviewing. <laughs> okay. I didn't, and then that, we ended by going, so you're all right then. And then we went to yeah. an ad. And I talk about weapons manufacturers. <laughs> yes, yeah. Finish so, on it. So I think, I think people are allowed to be the authors of their work. Yes. I think they are allowed. I mean, I, I, I honestly think this is, it's a real to and fro. Comedy is supposed to entertain people who've gone out for the night. Yeah. And if you're making, if you're ruining some of those people's nights, I would say you're not doing your job very well. But other people go, I'm an agitator. <laughs> yeah. I'm, making I'm a disruptor. Yeah, I I'm, I'm a jester. <laughs> Making society a... look in the mirror. And they, <laughs> they, they I'm a of, jester. They do. They say that. They go, mm. oh, um, it's, like the, it's like Shakespeare's time. I'm talking truth to power. Like they really do think that they're, they're <laughs> like anarchists mm. um, yeah. about themselves and their work. And, you know, good luck. <laughs> but I'm, I'm a people pleaser and I well, want yeah. people to be pleased yeah. I'd rather they but were surely like, all yeah. comedians are people pleasers some of them really enjoy some, some people I remember some people say things like a groan is as good as a laugh <laughs> Who <laughs> said that? Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah, that's, so like, so it's the, the idea, worst so, thing so ever. Like, if, some people like puns and wordplay and things. <laughs> Grove is, is, is good as a that's, that's why stand up is similar to comedy as well. Yeah. Uh, to um, sex, sorry, not yeah. comedy. <laughs> <laughs> if I can get a groan, I know that. Yeah. I'm, uh... yeah. But that, yeah. but I do find it um, because I, I would say that there must be a part of a lot of comedians, right? Because as a comedian, you're 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 not so sort of narcissistic. I suppose, or like anyone in any trade, right? When you're, when you're trying to entertain others, you're not just going out there, oh, the reason why I'm doing this is because I think I'm really funny and I want to see if other mm. people think I'm funny. You're, you're doing it because you're going, well, actually for me, what it does, it's sort of, I get it to go on stage, something I love to do. I get to write stuff, which is um, a kind of sort of very fun, sort of artistic way to release whatever it is. But also there must be a sense of where you do people please. Yeah. Like comedians are, are people pleasers because they are yeah. the jester. The jester yes. was there to please yeah. Others speaking the jester. But this is why someone wrote a really good response to someone calling themselves the jester because the jester was someone who was an outsider at court, whereas lots of comedians are mi millionaires. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so the idea of like, mm. oh, I'm just talking truth to power. It's like, oh, you are the establishment. Well, we are. Yes. Because we are the establishment. Like That's what yeah. I find funny now is like, that comedians were, a, a, a comedian, right, is typically, they're like the underdog. Mm. That's what you sort of, as a sort of, Watchers as the audience, the watchers. The watchers. <laughs> That's what I. Mean. The watchers. Really creepy. Yeah. 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 As the watchers. Hello, watchers. <laughs> How are we doing, watchers? <laughs> Thanks for coming. But as audience yeah. members, you're there looking at the comedian, and you you're definitely sort of saying, right, you have control as the audience. The comedian doesn't really have control. What they think, right? Mm. You're going, well, you make me laugh. 
So here we go. Mm. And then you make love, you go, oh, I like you because you're actually making mm. me laugh. So there's a control thing. However, it doesn't quite work because actually the, the comedians, especially, you know, we know comedians now make a huge amounts of money and they go, I don't really need to be here. So oh, do, yeah. do you see what I mean? So actually it, the sort of roles have changed in terms of like, in terms of, I don't know how to put this without sound, making it sound that money is the beer owner because it's absolutely not. Well, it, but, but it is an important factor in status. Yes, uh, yeah. And it, and it always will be. Yes. But, um, Steve Martin wrote an amazing book about stand-up because he was an unsuccessful stand-up for a really long time and then he became successful, which is a lot less fun than being unsuccessful. When he was playing stadiums, um, they didn't ever want to hear his new material. They wanted, because he had this really, really successful album. So he was having to do really old material that they knew every word to, so weren't laughing. Mm. Um, but, but he has something about sort of dressing in a suit. As he said, as a comedian, even if your life is terrible, even if you're going to talk on stage about how terrible your life is, you have to look like it's going well because the audience have to believe. Well, look at this down and out, keeps falling over and ruining things, but they have to believe you're successful. Otherwise, why are they there? Why are they paying their money to watch you? Mm. And Louis C.K., who just won a Grammy, controversially. Did he? Yeah. What? Yeah. So that's another controversy. Get out of town. So, um, for some people controversy but he used to have an amazing routine about flying business class so like when he's doing a routine about actually here's here was his line i'm I'm gonna murder it but basically it was how um mm-hmm. um so i was on an airplane in business class because my life's going better than yours with the self-awareness which is obviously what everyone always loved about louis ck so um with the self-awareness of comedians ha- a comedian like him when you're sitting in a, a room full of tens of thousands of people you know how much money they're making, not only in their life, but that night from yeah, you. Yeah, you, you can do you it. You can't pretend mm. that aspect of it isn't there. So you have to acknowledge, you have to acknowledge it. it. That's yeah. very so. funny. That's why when you have Mickey Flanagan walk stage, he does a very funny skit where he, he pretends he's got a leaf blower and he blows away the 50 pound notes. Does it? Yeah, he oh, does. Yeah. He's, 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 yeah. But yeah, he's, oh, I'm so rich. I have to use a leaf blower. That's very funny. I think I killed that. Yeah. No, no, but it's the same thing. It's yeah. going, here's my honesty now to the audience. You first got involved when I was doing stand-up about this because mm. that's when my life was. And now that went so well, I have to find a new shtick or a new version of it. Comedy, I still think, is one of the only places really where you can't become a, like an v- overnight sensation. Like, like mm. loads of other things you can. Yeah. Music you can, right? Oh, yeah. And but but, but you still have to learn your instrument. You couldn't become an overnight sensation and go, I know three chords on the guitar. No. But you would, you, there's still, I think, comedy... Number one, I think it's a place where working class people, there's no um, advantages. There's no parental advantages like, oh, yeah, yeah. my dad's uh, of this, so we my can dad's, do that. Um, Johnny Vegas. So <laughs> I'm already John- at the Apollo. <laughs> like you don't get this like, oh, um, yeah, nepotism. And the, the venues, all of it is quite cross class. There's no advantage to certain universities. Yes. There is in sketch actually, but not in stand up. Is there right. in sketch? In sketch, there's the whole footlights thing. For a very long time, it was all you know, like Stephen Fry and people like that. Mm. Yeah. Footlights and... uh, But that's interesting. So it is, it's one of those places that isn't, but when I say viral hit, yeah, I understand with the musicians, you have to have that time and things Mm. like that, but you can suddenly have a song that goes off. But But people in stand-up would go, like there are some comics and this is like, they're brilliant comics who just know who they are so quickly, like Ramesh Ranganathan, he's much newer than I am. And he probably did Apollo like after four years after his first gig, maybe three. It was so soon. What? He knew who he was. He had so much stuff to talk about. He was so naturally brilliant. Mm. He's so naturally brilliant. There are certain people. Other people take like a decade to find their voice. Um, Ashling B is about two years newer than me, or maybe three years. And I remember watching her first or maybe second gig. She was an actor. She was emceeing a night at, um, somewhere in Clerkenwell, this pub. And she was so funny. The audience didn't want any of the acts to come on. And she was just chatting to him. She was just asking him questions. Like she really? wasn't even a stand up at that point. And then everyone just kept saying, have you seen Ashling B? Have you seen this girl Ashling B? Mm. Like she wow. was forced to become a comedian because she was just so exceptionally funny. That is so, do you think, do you think now the comedy circle, like everything else has changed slightly? Where, yeah. where it's not where you can find, okay, let's go and do a gig in the pub. Now mm. let's go and do a gig yeah. in a bigger pub. And let's go and do a gig in now the comedy, you know, uh, comedy store. It's now that there is so many more aspects to it and also people are so it's very hard to find new comics because people have yeah. their 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 but, but i would say it would be like music in that to find new comics you just have to go to the places where bands are actually playing getting together and doing their first gigs because there are there's so many open mic nights but actually people want a bit of privacy when they're when, when they're, they're doing practicing. It. yeah they're practicing mm. they don't want massive crowds you want crowds of 10 people where you're kind of working out what you do but it has changed because 
this shows so, so in, when I first started comedy I was like everyone's so lovely because it's a time of plenty because it went from being four channels to all these digital channels so there were so many places for people to do comedy and mm. so many panel shows and it felt like a time of plenty yeah like so everyone was being really generous my generation all like the bitter old guys from the old days who are very like you know competitive with each other we're all just like encouraging mm. and f we're actually friends and then <laughs> so so that was like an amazing change and then now the change is online yeah TikTok i know and youtube yeah. and things i don't understand don't do and i, I spoke so about, then you become a bit bitter it's like oh god i don't get it it's not bitterness it's more just going oh i'm the dinosaur so mm. quickly <laughs> so quickly i went from being a fresh young thing <laughs> the future and then so i yeah i spoke at, um, a stand-up course the other day and they were all like so what do you have to do online and i was like nothing <laughs> have a twitter tweet about your gigs <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, but it's all like people now have TikToks and they have all this yeah. money. And that's, they said agents would ask in like about we are following. They ask when, when you have your meetings, like how many followers have you got? And I'm like, oh, I don't know how to prepare. How many, many, many watches? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, many, how many people watching? <laughs> I, I, I guess with, with the social media stuff, especially with TikTok, that's where you will start to get comedians who kind of do become an overnight sensation. Yes. They have one skit and it just blows up. Yeah, and then, yeah, but it's different. But then, then they've got to then build on that, and they actually yeah. don't it's have this armory. It's editing. Of, it's different. Of, it's uh, editing. I think though, it's a different format. But well, no, no, it does I'm not, mean I'm not saying so about the format or anything. Yeah. I'm just saying you will have people that can create themselves. They do. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but the guy who does a really, he did a really, really fantastic parody of Will Smith. He did a song. Um, uh, Munya. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah and that's, that, that's, a, that's within COVID times, isn't it? Yeah, but he blew up over that. Exactly, exactly. So, and he, and I was gonna say, everyone knows his name. <laughs> yeah, we did. I proved he did it. But, but we were definitely recognizable, mm. absolutely. And then that, that can, can be transferred because he's got a panel show now. Does he have a panel show? Yeah, yeah he's doing lots of TV Nappet. stuff I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. With Jess Nappett. Mm -hmm. Jess Nappett, and I think Tom Allen. It's three of them, anyway. Um, oh, it's, I, I know, it's the yes. Channel 4 one about the news. Yeah, is someone telling you in your ear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that... Yeah, yeah, it's about the news. Yeah, but yeah. I think I, I do agree with you, though. I, I, I think that comedy has changed and everything has changed. Mm -hmm. But I, I still feel that... Um, I, feel, I feel that people have their... The comedians that they like... And gone are kind of the days where you would go and watch, oh, this new comedian. Mm. People are so instant now that they want to go, I know that person. Okay, I'm going to see them. Oh, that's, that's your take. So my take is yeah. it's expensive to see. So again, it comes down to money. So Edinburgh, let's say everything used to cost a five, five pounds in the 80s. Mm. So if you went to Edinburgh with your 50 pounds, you could take a risk on people you hadn't seen. You could also go and see Frank Skinner, who you really liked, da, 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 and that would be your festival. When you make it 17 pounds or 20 pounds yeah. to go and see comedy on a Saturday night, um, I'm I'm rich and I find that shocking. Yes, I, like, it's I go, shocking. No comedy is that good. Like, yes. yeah, what are you doing? Um, and so, and then some people, obviously, a lot more than that. But yeah. at least when it's a musical and you're paid eighty pounds, she goes, mm. "There's loads of costumes. <laughs> there's loads of people on stage." And I can get round trees at like half time yeah, or whatever. It is. Built a bit. There's a top bit on the theatre, and a stand up walks out, and there's t shirt person, and jeans. Yeah. You're like, oh, come on, mate. <laughs> <laughs> with your little mic stand that you yeah, move yeah. out of the way there's nothing to look at <laughs> so so i think so there's I, nothing to look so, at so that's the problem it's like how can you take a risk on a new comic if that's going to be and then people don't want to go to free comedy because they think it's bad because there are free comedy yes they don't, they don't like it yeah so, so psychologically you want to have invested something but it should be i think it should be cheaper than the cinema as in you can buy cinema's a, expensive exactly so you could go if it's in a pub you can buy a couple of drinks and watch the comedy, it should be cheaper than the cinema. So the comedy should cost seven pounds. That's what I mean. Wow, I okay, said, I get it. There's new comedy nights, there's six comedians on. They've all, you know, they've gigged before. They're not Jamie Lang at the comedy store. Yeah, they're, they're, that was free, I think. That was a real freebie to come watch that. But I agree with yeah. you, I think that's totally right. Yeah. Can I also, uh, okay, what happens? And you're, you, you broke up with another comedian. Oh yeah. Um, are you friends with him? Is that what this is? No, going? no, okay. we're not. But I've got him here today. He's, he's yeah. got a podcast. Does he have a podcast <laughs> yeah. as well? He's is there, is there a, a podcast boy club? Is yeah. there a <laughs> WhatsApp <laughs> group where you slag me off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got that, that. that was a serious question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's not. A yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so you, you guys were, you guys both did material about mm. each other. Yeah. Did you watch his set? I didn't watch his show after we broke up. Um, I really, and part of the reason was because I really wanted him to have his privacy. Mm. If you knew your ex was going to come and see it, number one, that show would be really weird. Yeah. Because the people in the audience who did know who he was talking about would also know I was there. 
So but does that yeah. make an element of like, oh my god, excitement? Oh my god, oh my god! I, my theory, very arrogantly, was that that show did really well because the people, lots of people, lots of his audience did know who he was talking about. When yes. You go, when you go on stage and you go, my ex girlfriend leaves the toilet seat up. I don't know. I, oh, haven't, I haven't seen good the show. Gag. Yeah. <laughs> I pissed myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Massive. Massive. I, I haven't seen the show, but if they say something <laughs> like that, when you actually know who they're talking about and it feels a bit naughty or a bit like, oh, I'm getting inside information, I think it makes it. Funnier. It does. It makes or, it more relatable. Yeah, they more understand relatable, it. Rather than just, God, he's just talking about his ex for an hour. How boring. So we didn't go and see each other's stuff. And it was like the ending of a film, actually, because when we were together, he had this obsession with winning the award in Edinburgh. This is big award. It used to be called the Perrier. It's got different names all the time. And he used to, he used to sometimes be in the bath, like practicing his speeches. And I was such an unsupportive his, his uh, acceptance, acceptance speech. speech. So I, I was Shut such up. an unsupportive girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. You're never going to win it. But I would say, I would say, <laughs> You're too, like, you're just a straight stand up. Like, that always goes to, like, mimes or people dressed as balloons. <laughs> like, it goes to people doing, like, really, like, pushing the genre forward. Yeah. Like, it's a, about the art. People yeah. dressed as balloons, people pushing <laughs> the genre forward. <laughs> yeah, that's it. People doing mimes as well. That's like, <laughs> no, they do. Uh, mimes have won it twice in the time really? I've been what? doing it. Yeah. So it's always very, very funny shows, I have to say. I'm not saying this dismissively. The show that wins is never. It, it was not was never in my experience just a guy with a microphone right. talking about his life. It was always someone where you went, wow, I've never seen that done before, as well as very funny. So He's I, got oh, Hummus. So, so I kept his, saying to him. <laughs> <his cock>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept saying to him, let go of him. He was so obsessed with it and he'd be so broken hearted on the day he wasn't nominated for the award. And then we broke up and he only fucking went and won it. <laughs> Did he actually? Like, it was the end of oh a movie. God. It was the end of a... All I had to do was leave him. All I had to all do... All you had to do all that You time. were holding him back. Yeah. It so was that, your disbelief kept, in him. I kept thinking if this was a film, like the, the, the end of it would be reminding you that I went into him and he was in the bathroom and you're never going to win. <laughs> <laughs> no one believes If they do a biopic, you're going to be that horrible that's ex. It. That's, that's like, it. Laughing at yeah, him. Yeah. You, you're, you're a loser. Exactly. Exactly. You'll never make it. I know. And then he was this incredible success story. My, my agent... In Edinburgh, you really kind of focused on yourself. My agent said, um, the day that nominations came out, she rang to check I was okay. And I was like, well, I, I thought you were ringing to say you died. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have himself. you heard? Have yes, you heard? Yeah, she was like, have you heard about John? I was like, oh. And she was like, and I, I, it was just, it was like the ending of a film. But that's quite a nice no, round I mean, up in a great nice. way. It is nice. And I think, it, I wish it was juicier. There's not much gossip in comedy. So people who no. have to write about comedy, journalists, they would love it if there was much more like, and and then he did this, and then she did that. But actually, it's a sort of like it's straightforward. we really respect each other. And... What about after we got that award? We like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, then so I was yeah. uh, I was sniffing round again. Got, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ten, ten grand he got. Yeah. <laughs> <It's present. laughs> And oh, genuinely, <laughs> ten just, grand he got. <laughs> Standing outside is in your best boots. Yeah, like. yeah. yeah. yeah someone made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it is, it is, it is true. But I didn't realize. What about you? Have you ever had relationships with people in the same industry? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I have. I, I, I married my my fiance. You married your fiance. I married my by getting married to my fiance. <laughs> That's not a job. Yeah, that, <laughs> getting married to my fiance. Yeah. But I've I've I think dating within the same industry, um, unless it's I think it's I think it's tricky. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's tricky. Uh, because I would say it was tricky for what we were doing because the whole sole purpose was to focus in on relationships ah. and the currency was drama. They wanted yeah. to. They wanted chaos. Did you ever genuinely get your feelings hurt? Do people get yeah. genuinely hurt? Oh yeah, hurt? definitely. People definitely That's get hurt. That's horrible. Yeah, it, 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 reality it's, is hard on the soul. It's yeah. it's it's like it's like it's too much. You, and also, what happens is that's why I always find it interesting about comics is um, when you do reality TV, you think everything's a scene because you're doing it so much. Yeah. So then, when you go into dinner parties with your friends or you go for meetings, you think you're in a scene. Oh. So you think you have to entertain. So you're oh. always, you're all, or I was, I was always on entertain mode. Yeah. All the time. But also, I guess you've always got cameras. Always have cameras. Making you feel a bit mad, but a bit, you're visible. And then especially mm. if you are recognized. Yeah. Then you are visible actually, everywhere you are. If you're in a bar having a conversation. You're always on show. And you're, yeah. and you're also on show for being who you are. So that makes it even harder. So yeah. you're constantly having this internal conversation with yourself is that like okay i'm not funny enough all oh, that scene wasn't good enough not even scenes mm. so basically you're meeting your friends or your you know yeah. relatives whatever it is and you think well i'm gonna get an uber rating at the end yeah. of this you know, and I, that's um, tough i've been making documentaries and so while it's not the same as a sort of structured reality it is because um very similarly you know you're interviewing an old man in a church 
and you can feel <laughs> what's, that it's, what's the documentary <laughs> <laughs> old, men, old men in churches yeah. Yeah. it's um, gonna be big <laughs> um it's on bbc4 uh, <laughs> so, but you have a, the voice in your head is the director going come on Look, make it juicy. Like, there you where's, go. Where's the? Oh right, the, yeah, yeah. You got can't me. just go. This is lovely. Both agreeing with each other because it's church. boring. It's yeah. boring for a documentary. Where's the story? It's it's always and then you find yourself having to do things that aren't authentic. On one documentary, I was made mm. to be scared of bees, and it felt you know <laughs> because <laughs> sorry, what is sorry? That? <laughs> that is the most random what it thing. Was, is that I was travelling with a blind man. And Sorry, oh, are, you, are you sure you haven't had like a manic episode and you created this fake documentary? Sorry, Sorry it's another one of my lines. This happened to Joanna Lumley. Yeah. Um, um, so, so if 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 me and this blind guy go and look go and look at some bees, that is not an interesting apparently documentary. I'm, I'm into it. So it, it sounds to, amazing. I, but, so it had to be that I was scared and he persuaded me to go and see it. And so it's just a lie. It's just a lie. How did you? Uh, that's quite a weird thing to pitch to you. Can you pretend you're scared of them? Well, you're like, what? It's probably what happened to you. The yeah. director comes and says, "This isn't working. Here's you're going to stand downstairs. <laughs> you're going to go stand downstairs, and you're going to say it's too rickety. You don't want to go up. And and so and essentially, what you do is you say a version of that. It's 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 deeper than that for for I think for me in the sense mm. is where you have that internal dialogue with someone saying that to you, but also you have it in yourself because you're yeah. thinking, if I don't make this good enough. Oh then I'm not going to be used anymore. So therefore, there's even that going on. So you're always on. kind of auditioning. You're, all, you're auditioning every time. Because what that's similar to, I didn't realise we'd have so much crossover, is panel shows, because panel shows yes. aren't your actual job, right? Stand up is your job, mm. but they're money, they're exposure, they're fun, you get wine in a mug. Yeah. And every single one, you never think, uh, you're always going, I have to be good if I want to be invited back in a year Absolutely. Or I guess the panel shows, you can sort of sit back a little bit more than you would be able to do for stand up, right? And you just kind of, yes. someone else is running the show. But, what, but no one ever goes, Sarah was a great team player. Let's yeah. her have her back. Or she was a great laugher at other people. Mm. You really are. So actually what you have is a thing of like, they're being really funny. I need to like yeah. jump in. I need to say something. Yeah. That, that's actually, panel shows are, are really tricky um, because it's exactly that. And, and there, there's, it, it's, it's a real talent where, that's why some comedians don't work on panel shows because oh, they try and they, it becomes, they, some comedians I find they have to be the funny one. And when they're the funny one, they don't let anyone else be funny. Mm. And that's the worst for a panel show. Mm. So the best thing to do is to be funny, but also be generous with it. Yeah. And so that's quite a hard thing as well. Cause you're yeah. like, well, I need to show off, but yet I don't want to show off too much because I steal it from the everyone people else. People I love to watch on panel shows. So I would use Would I Lie To You as an example, are people who are really funny off the back of what other people have said. So like Lee Mack, who everyone agrees is just, you know, so witty, so quick. Mm. What's wonderful about him is he wants you to talk, because he knows he's going to say a funny thing at the end. Yeah. So you get to talk, yes. you get to finish your story, and then he's quiff at the end, which gets a big round of applause. And you both feel, oh, that was brilliant. Yeah, because like, you're was, both feeling good. Yeah, you both feel heard. Mm. It is true. It's, it's like a constant audition. But that does bring you back to the thing with comedy, which is where that's why I find it hard. You come off stage and you have to go, okay, now I can be Sarah again. I, I can be myself mm. again, rather than that sort of slightly volumed up version of myself when I'm on stage. Yeah. And that's all, I always found that very hard to step back into. Yeah. And so for, for years, for a couple of years, maybe three years, I was troubling with this like existence of myself where I was like, well, this is who I am, but way more volumed up version, mm. but I need to find that original person again. Did you? Yeah. For you were like the, the movie Split when he's got like 23 personalities. Yeah, it was like that. Into the beast. At the <laughs> it was, yeah. it was like that. And I, would then, and I would then become so socially anxious because I wouldn't yeah. want to go and have a lunch with someone because I thought, well, I'm going to have to make them laugh. Did you have therapy about it? Yeah, like, that's what you, saved oh, yeah. me. I still do therapy every week yeah. because of that. I remember walking into the therapy session and saying, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just feel like, I feel like I... I have to be funny all the time. Mm. And they yeah. went, okay, this doesn't sound right. And I went, yeah, yeah it doesn't feel right. It's interesting that it's funny <laughs> because humor is a distance. It's, mm. uh, it, uh, it's a way of never being authentic, actually. So joking it's a, it's a is layer, flippancy. Yeah. And so it's a oh, self-protective thing. And it's why most comics aren't very funny in real life. Because, you know, they're funny at work and then mm. they just disappoint taxi drivers. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's literally it's it. Like, literally, you just go around disappointing people. It's like, no, this is how that I actually That is so am. true. Because, yeah, because yeah, cause I, I, I would probably say that I, I can't write, I can't write funny, like no is, but I can probably tell a funny story that's happened mm. to me. And so then that, that would be fine because then that's every day. Yeah, but if you had to, if, like, if your living was performing stand-up, you would learn to write it, like playing an instrument. It's like going, oh, I can't play the tuba. 
you would you would learn by doing it you would craft you would have some yeah, stories you that you kind of what you go out and try it and then you'd look and go it never works when i say that word or that bit doesn't work so i'll stop saying that bit like he would become a writer of it, it becomes a jigsaw yeah because some comics are much more sort of improvisers it's much more an oral thing and they learn mm. and they remember what they've said before what are you what do you do are you i'm, I'm a, i like a pad and stationary but I also like going out and having like a very small idea and just talking because you absolutely know. Because the, the first thing is, is it interesting? Yeah. And then if it's interesting, you can make it funnier. God. If it's not interesting. So, so then what do you prefer? What do you prefer, writing stand-up or running your, your shows, your TV shows? Um, stand-up is like my pudding, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, can do, I can do proper writing in the day if I've yeah. got stand-up at night. Stand-up's my social life. And I'm still like obsessed with comedy. But like, this is why I love this conversation. Yeah, yeah, no, like, I, I talk I can about tell. comedy forever, and I'm so interested in it, and I love watching other people. And actually, that's why I think the whole new comedians thing. COVID's been interesting because there's been two years of comics not being able to gig very much. Mm -hmm. But what's going to come out of that? I think people are going to be really surprised. Is the diversity of representation? Because really, people, there's been a lot of people. COVID took everything away mm. from everyone in terms of social things and um, enjoyment, being in crowds as watchers it took it all away and it made people really evaluate what what did i really enjoy what do i really miss what do i feel really out of control of and for lots of people they were like why didn't i do stand up when i had a chance yeah those people are going to be coming to the forefront it's gonna be very exciting i think that is so true because they suddenly gone right let's listen life is short life is this life is that yeah. like i was born in the other thing i'm gonna go and give yeah. it a go and if it's always there for you to go oh i'll try next week or i'm busy at work or mm. i feel scared and then you go oh my god i can't do it i should have done i, I want to do it so listen, um, I've just realized we've taken so much of your time up. We have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've had a really lovely time. I had the loveliest <laughs> time, yeah. especially on a Monday. Um, listen, do, we, do you have any shows? To, can we come watch you? Anything at all? I've got a tour starting in November. Come so on. I'm writing about. Ooh. So what I'm trying to write about uh, is two kinds of success. So basically career and pregnancy. Like, that's, what, that's what the show is. And how you about. juggle it. How, no, no. How, literally having success because I had a really successful job, but couldn't have this one thing that I wanted. So that's right. what I try and write about. That's what the show will be about. But funny. <laughs> I know it's yeah. not, it's, it's not yeah, yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> just any, any fake fears yeah. chucked in there? <laughs> I'm terrified of bees throughout. Uh, so listen, thank you so much for coming on. Especially, no, honestly, thoroughly enjoyed it more than anything. Um, what we'd like to do at the end of the podcast is leave our listeners with something inspirational. Inspirational? Yeah, from you. Okay. Um, right. I've got, yeah. I've got two quotes come to mind. <laughs> Can't wait. One of them it harks back to something we were talking about in terms of punching down yeah. and, and all of this, the kind of ideas of people as agitators. There's a Michael Frayn quote from the 80s when he was asked about, I think, spitting image. Mm. And he was asked about comedy, um, sort of talking truth to power. And he said, and I think this is really important, I meant to say at the time we were talking, he said that if, um, if you're being I'm, again i'm butchering it my memory wait. but basically um if your voice if you can hear your voice in a current setup then it's working for you oh Does i that like that I, yeah I, i'm really butchering it. but basically if you can hear people if people are amplified if they have platforms then they are part of the system yeah yeah they're not working against it yeah i like yes, that I'm, i really butchered it and um the other one and this is i heard in a yoga class <laughs> <laughs> but I really find it helpful for any kind of like putting yourself mm. out of their work, but especially for me for stand up, is um, uh, nothing to prove, everything to share. Yeah. I think that takes the pressure off you sometimes a little okay. bit of going, it's not about being the best. Yeah. To make stuff, to yeah, do stuff. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you just have to go, I've just got these things to share if anyone wants some. Uh, I, I, just before we go, Oscar Wilde said one, which I heard the other day that Stephen Fry was saying that he said, it's something, I'm going to butcher it as well. But he's, God, we're it's, such a bad Yeah, yeah, yeah. Club. This is going to be really good. <laughs> it was something like um, Oscar Wilde said, to, to know what you want to do in life. Um, is a a terrible curse. Oh yeah. So it's a terrible curse to know to to not know what you want to do is a, is an incredible freedom mm. or something. Like that. And it's so true. We is talk, it about getting what you want or knowing what you want? It, knowing what you want. Oh, it's about it? knowing what you want. Yeah. They say that you can be a you can be a lawyer, a, a yeah. architect, whatever it is. That's great, but you know where your life's going to go. Actually, yeah. the way more fun thing is to not know where your life is going to go. Yeah. And actually, you're way more free. And yeah. that was quite a cool thing. I liked yeah. it. Anyway, on that note, Sarah, thank you so much. Everybody, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye!